great message that she left us with. Um, Keith McKeever would like to have just a couple of minutes to say something about uh, storm order runoff control.
up into Maine. So you can now look at habitats throughout the whole of the Northeast US. And if we take those habitats, as we have done, and look at where they occur in the Adirondacks on protected and unprotected <laughs> land, we see some really interesting patterns. So don't worry about the dots on here for a second, but just pay attention to the proportions in the green, which is state land and easement land together, and the unprotected, which would be private land without any easement. And look at the distribution of those habitats. And you'll see, as I do, I hope that there are some of them that have a whole bunch of green. Those are lands where we have almost all of it, or large proportions of it, in, in state ownership or in easement. There are some, however, that are almost entirely distributed on private land. If we draw a line across here, that's 50 to 60 percent. We can sort of distinguish and say, you know, there's some habitats that are somewhat equivalent. We have them well represented on both. But there are some that, that are very highly skewed toward one or the other. If you then look at the dots on this graph, those are the proportion of all of our vertebrates in the Adirondacks <coughs> that would use those habitats. So we have 260 or 280 total species in the Adirondack Park. And if you look at the habitats that they would use, the proportion of them that would use some of these is really strikingly different across this gradient here. You can look at, and, and see some interesting patterns whereby we've got the, rice, the, the rocks and ice you know, pretty well protected. The alpine, <laughs> the rocky stuff, uh, the scrubby stuff at the tops of the mountains, as happens in all protected areas around the world, is well protected. It's highly, highly represented in the state land. But it's not used by that many things. <laughs> it's, it's not ideal habitat for too many species. At the other end of the spectrum, there are some neat habitats. And if I was a, a creature that was particularly fond of central oak pine communities or central hardwood swamp communities, I'd be paying attention to the fact that those habitats, in fact, are disproportionately represented on private lands in the Adirondacks. Oak is a hugely valuable wildlife food species. It draws in critters from, from far, far distances. So these are the kinds of habitats that I think should trigger, or should at least be paid attention to in any sort of site analysis. You can look at where they're distributed, just those few that I highlighted there, and, and you can see that these are very small percentage of the park landscape. They're in very, very tiny um, acreages. TNC would never form any sort of acquisition strategy around a two-acre parcel of Central Harbor Swamp. They're not on the state land, <laughs> by and large, but they have high value for wildlife. And, and sort of the, the framework of how development is done right now is, is unlikely to capture these kinds of features. So this is an example of the reason why an ecological site assessment can be absolutely critical prior to the development process. So again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the scale. I think we can talk about a site assessment or a natural resource inventory on a lot of different scales. I'll talk about some examples of how we might do this and, and how it might be done well and done not so well. And maybe start to think about who should be doing this. Um, what I think we want to start by asking, you know, what are the, are the things that, that we would hope an ecological site assessment could do for us in the Adirondacks? One is to meet some stated conservation goals. So in the Nature Conservancy, you might have very specific goals for kinds of, of lands that you want to protect. If you're the Wildlife Conservation Society, you might have wildlife targets, populations of, of, of animals that you're worried about. If you're the Adirondack Park Agency, you might look to the APA Act for the kinds of conservation goals and, and, and ambitions that you have for protecting this landscape. I think, in particular, we want to focus on individual habitat types, like some of the ones I just talked about that we know are important. We also want to focus on particular species. I personally would argue that going beyond just a threatened and endangered species, and maybe thinking about species of greatest conservation need, which are identified by New York State, identified by every state in the nation, would be a good starting point. You might worry about particular landforms. And I think more importantly, we want to also think about not just individual sites, but how we can put these things together to um, protect ecological function and things of connectivity. So thinking about scale for a minute, um, and thinking about very large scales, we can in some ways view the Ladies and Development Plan, the fruit salad map, as an ecological site analysis. It was done with an underlying uh, um, understanding and, and tremendous knowledge of the ecological conditions in the park. It puts things in specific areas, it sets densities, it, it, was, it was very forward thinking in its time, very McCargian and, and great um, in the time that it was created. Um, I think there are ways that it could be improved now, but it is an example of a large scale prioritization <laughs> to some extent. 
Another example of the project I just talked I just talked about, which we're affectionately calling the Rare Stuff Is project, which I presented at the art conference, and we're now writing up for um, the Adirondack Journal of Environmental Studies. But that's another example of sort of a gap analysis way that you might go about thinking about prioritizing and um, and, and assessing the whole of the park on a landscape scale. And lastly, I just want to highlight some other ones that are out there. Um, the Nature Conservancy primarily has an ecoregional assessment. That's tremendous for all of the all of the northern Appalachian and Canadian region. Um, they also have done some modeling of what they call terrestrial resilience, which involves a couple of different layers. This is a layer called local connectivity. So it's a measurement of the degree to which our landscape and everything down to West Virginia is permeable. You could use it on any scale to look at ecological connections and local and regional levels. They've done it on sort of with a larger focus area, thinking about um, regional flows. Again, ecological processes. This is where we can see some flows between the Adirondacks and other green places nearby, like the Tug Hill um, and the Southern Greens. And they put those two things together into something called resilience. Areas that are expected to have the highest possibility to persist and to continue their functionality and their integrity in the face of things like climate change and land use change. And the park as a whole, you know, looks pretty good when you compare it to some nearby places. Um, but we could also use this on smaller scales. And so I just point these out as, as resources that are out there, tremendous thinking that's been done by really smart people like Mark Anderson to already sort of prioritize and, and, and assess the Adirondacks on a landscape scale. We can also talk about individual towns. Um, and I now know more about Brunswick, <laughs> knowing where this probably came from. Um, but Brunswick is a terrific example of a town that has has been very forward thinking. In addition to the general zoning that exists for the town of Brunswick, they have an overlay zone, um, which was put together with a lot of thought and some field work, um, getting out on the ground to identify some features of importance for that landscape, including things like high and moderate value wetlands, natural resource protection zones, wildlife corridors that they've identified and verified with some ground truthing, um, and wildlife habitat blocks. So that's one example of how and it's a town might think about doing a site assessment at the level of, of their type of town. Another example from here in the Adirondacks is the town of Brighton, where we are now. Uh, Brighton got a, a grant to do a smart growth plan. They came to us a couple of years ago and asked us to help them out with that, just in terms of providing information. So we provided to them some of the resources that would be available to help them think about um, how to structure development and how to plan for development in their town, including things like land protection, Water resources, um, we've got some aquatic information from Hillary, core wildlife habitats, which we can map them on big scales, um, and anything that we've had as far as modeled or observed or predicted wildlife observations. And so they now have that information available to them in terms of thinking about where they might want to and, and where they might want not want to put the government in the future. Then we can talk about the local scale, and I think this is most relevant to what Brandon Laren was just talking about, and here we get into that wonderful um, tool of conservation development. And here again, I think it's an opportunity where we can protect specific features, not just at the site scale that we've identified as being important on a particular area, but also on larger scales as we put these things together and think about their cumulative effect across the landscape when we think about things like ecological connectivity. <coughs> so this is going to be somewhat similar to what Brandon Laren was showing you, but I just created a hypothetical example of what this might look like, and, and again, here we are in Brighton, this is an example I made a couple, of, a couple of years ago, but let's imagine that there's a 760-acre chunk of resource management in Brighton. Let's imagine that it's it's um, adjacent to wild forests and it's currently owned by a logging company. The developer can therefore market it as having adjacency to state land. There's some roads that they might be able to make use of already. Maybe the loggers can't afford to keep it anymore, so again, not an unlikely scenario for the Adirondacks and one that we see um, relatively frequently in this landscape. We can look at it up close on an aerial photograph, and we can think about what the traditional design might be as the developer comes in and just takes that, that acreage and divides it up into however many lots he's trying to get, and, and quite often in some of these resource management areas, they might want to go for that large lot back to pretty spread out style of development. We know that the, agents, the park agency is going to map the wetlands and has already mapped the wetlands and the steep slopes. Everybody accepts that those are things that we're not going to be able to develop. So we know that we're starting from that standpoint. In a conservation zone, however, let's say we also get out onto the landscape and identify some important features like 
Rusty Blackbird, maybe it lives in one of these little peatlands. Maybe there's a gray jay there, or a royal chickadee, or, or an all-sided flycatcher. These are some of the rarest birds in the state that like these little peatland habitats that we happen to have all over the town of Brighton, actually. And say so we can identify those as being important features because they're very rare birds and we care about keeping them around. Let's imagine that this chunk up here happens to be a really nice deer wintering area, or moose wintering area. Let's imagine that we identify another site over here that has really old trees, or it is one of those habitat types that I pointed out to you as being particularly important to wildlife. Let's imagine that it's a chunk of central oak pine, and it's only two acres, and nobody would have caught it in any larger scale analysis. Then we can also step back and look back at the core area mapping that we did for Brighton, where we identified large blocks of unfragmented forest of, of these, I think it was 150 acres. And we can see that the southeast corner of this, of this chunk of, re, of research management in Brighton happens to be in one of those core forest blocks. That's another tremendously valuable thing for wildlife and ecological connectivity. And we see that that's part of this landscape that we also might want to pay heed to. So we have the primary conservation features in, in the wetlands. <coughs> We have secondary conservation features, which we also have identified as being important on this particular site. Again, a conventional development might have done something like this. In this case, instead, we would put the houses totally outside the primary conservation areas, maybe somewhat adjacent to the secondary conservation areas, but trying not to impact them in any way, and we would draw the lot lines last, leaving us with you know, the whole western area of the property that could be a common property for the enjoyment of the people that live in this, in this particular subdivision. So I think we can talk about sort of a gradient of how you might want to do a natural resource inventory or a site assessment. And at one end of that, I think you have your sort of, your basic strategy, your basic assessment, um, <coughs> the bargain, bargain price assessment, maybe you might want to call it, um, in which we, of course, map the wetlands and the steep slopes because we know we have to do that. We give Heritage a call, stop over at the DEC office and say, hey, do you know anything about your canals brush or anything else that might be in this particular area? In this kind of scenario, most of the time, the scope of consideration is just the project site. The people that are involved outside of the folks that might go out there and delay at the wetlands is largely going to be engineers. <laughs> at the other end of the spectrum, I think we can talk about the LEED Platinum Assessment, or the Gold Standard Assessment, in which, let's say we had the opportunity to do everything we might possibly want to do. In this scenario, I think we would not only consult local experts like DEC and Heritage, but we would also consult other sources of information on species occurrence data that might be that <coughs> available for the area, some of the mapping that I highlighted to you, that all of those sort of regional scale maps I showed from TNC are publicly available. They can be downloaded and looked at if there's the capacity to do that. Um, we would map the wetlands and the steep slopes, but we also would hopefully try to map some of the key <coughs> features that we know are high importance and value to wildlife, like vernal pools. Chris Nowitzki talked about how we go in and we sort of mow down and make everything flat, and those little depressions are lost, and that has consequences for stormwater. It also has consequences for frogs that breed <coughs> in those vernal pools. Those are, are not going to be mapped in any sort of scenario. You have to go in order to find them. Um, critical habitats, like some of the ones I've highlighted previously. Snags, I showed this to my husband, he said, snags? You mean like dead trees? I said, yeah. <laughs> you don't think about that much in the Adirondacks because we have so many trees, but it, what looks like a hazard to us is it looks like home to 30 or 40 different bird species that breed in there. So go through the spot if you can, and if you find a few that, that aren't going to be a hazard, by all means, try to keep them in. Um, large core forest blocks, connectivity zones, we would want to be out in the field multiple seasons because we want to have some sense of the species that are present in all different times of the year. We would consider not just the site, but also its surroundings and the connectedness of the site to its surroundings. We might even do some analysis of alternative designs and map the ecological impact zones and look at how those would play out. And hopefully we would have involved in this scenario not just the engineers, but ecologists, naturalists, biologists, and others who have some knowledge of the area. So how do we get from where we are now to there? <laughs> I think one of the best things that could come out of today would be a collective dialogue about what some of those triggers are, what is the size or the characteristics of a project that needs to trigger a site assessment, and of what level of quality, what are the pieces of that sort of gold standard site assessment 
that we would want to see most of the time, or even some proportion of the time, and how do we make sure that those are happening. I think to the extent that we can start to have a conversation about that as a result of what we're talking about today, we have an opportunity to develop that standard and set, set that standard now. Um, we are starting to realize, based on questions we've gotten from presenting our work at the APA, from looking into conservation development rates throughout all of the Northeast, that there's not a lot of good examples on the books of where these, these kinds of site assessments are actually required. Seldomly do they actually require that they are done by ecologists. Even more seldomly are they required to be done prior to the site design, prior to the layout of the lots. So I think we have an opportunity to change that and to develop some good guidelines. And we're hoping, just within our office, to develop sort of some standards that we would, we would hope would go into something like this. And you should stay in touch with us if you'd like to, to be informed about when we have those developed. So to wrap up, I think there's, of course, challenges to this. Um, the demand drives the supply of the kind of folks that are going to do this work. As I mentioned, it's not required in very many places that you would do anything like that. So there's not a lot of folks who, who are out there doing these kinds of large-scale analyses. Jerry Jenkins is the kind of guy that's made a career out of doing this, but he, he and, and his like are kind of far, few and far between. Um, I would say that our regional and state information is not tremendously accessible in comparison to the neighboring states of Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine all have some amazing programs based on private land habitat management and, and uh, development and how to do it uh, that have much better resources than we do. The Hudson River Estuary Program in New York, which is on the beach through the AEC, does have some, some great resources as well. I think there's also issues of fairness, questions of who should pay for this, is it fair to put this on the backs of the developers? I think we can ask the question of, you know, if, if it costs a developer I don't know, I'm making up these numbers, but if it costs the developer $100,000 to do the engineering for a particular site, what if we ask for 5% of that? I could do a lot with $5,000 on, on just, even just with existing information. So I think that would, that's one place to start. Um, and we know that good information doesn't necessarily solve the capacity issue. The maps of terrestrial resilience and local connectivity, they're not, you know, incredibly tangible and easily easy to use. And, and the question's been asked this morning, you know, how many local planning boards have a GIS person or even a GIS system? We can help. We are an organization. We're an example of an organization that can certainly help. And I think there are other others that can help. But there is a capacity issue both at the local level and at the APA level just to, to have the to deal with some of these resources. That said, I think there are also opportunities. Um, there is good information available that's already been developed. There are great models out there. There are a range of options and scales. We don't always have to have the gold standard, but maybe we take some key pieces of it and try to get more and more of it happening. And I think we have the opportunity to be a model again. And I'm just going to throw up a slide with resources of places you might go. And I would add our website to that as well. Thank you.
we, uh, we wanted to do something to control that. And also, uh, you can see our beautiful mountain scenery here. Um, if you look on the right-hand slide, in the background, on the left side of the lake, uh, is a small hill called Gray Hill. We had a um, house go up on, on the hill, and fortunately for us, it uh, is mostly visible only at nighttime. You can see the lights. On the, uh, on the right side of the lake, way down the last mountain uh, before the lake takes a turn, uh, is called Clute Mountain. On uh, that mountain, we had a developer come in and speak with our code enforcement officer. The developer wanted to put a subdivision on the side of the mountain. Uh, our CEO talked to him told him uh, we needed uh, at least minimum 150 feet frontage uh, on, uh, on a public road, depending on the zone that it's in, uh, 200 feet or 300 feet uh, uh, in other parts of that mountain. Uh, usually when the CEO tells the developers this information, uh, they realize the tremendous cost involved with the uh, infrastructure of building a, a public road on the side of a mountain, and, uh, and they go away. Uh, but this developer didn't bite an eye, and uh, when he left, the, the uh, code enforcement officer fully inspected, I expected him to come back with a subdivision plan. Nearby the town today, uh, we also had houses built on the top of the mountain. On the, uh, on the right hand side is a uh, uh, picture taken from uh, the county road showing uh, the location of, uh, of a house on top of the hill. On the left hand side is a close up. Uh, this particular property owner owned a logging business and he had to clear cut a, a, an enormous amount of land on top of the mountain for his walking truck, uh, a shed for all his uh, construction equipment. And uh, when we uh, saw all these problems in our town and nearby, the town supervisor organized a committee to see what ought to be done to make sure that we protect our mountain scenery as best we could. When we got together, we found uh, that we, on, we only had two main options. One was to take our zones, which varied from 60,000 square feet uh, up to 3.2 acres, and then all the way up to 43 acres, and uh, revise them so that uh, There'd be decreased density on the mountains, make the, uh, make the lot size larger, so there'd be few out, fewer houses on the mountainside. Or we could leave the zoning alone and try to mitigate the, uh, the view of the, of the houses that are built. Uh, and that will be by creating an overlay zone, overlay district. We looked around uh, and uh, we found several places that had already considered overlay zones. Uh, 20 miles away from uh, the town today, uh, the Lake George Park Commission had a draft uh, overlay zone, which uh, was never enacted by uh, any of the towns within the, uh, within the uh, Park Commission. However, uh, they gave us a copy of their zone uh, of their draft law. We also consulted with Saratoga County uh, Planning Department and uh, they supplied us with several uh, existing overlay district laws. Uh, some of these were in the Catskill Mountains and some farther west in the state. And uh, we looked those over. Also the APA staff uh, provided us with, uh, with a great deal of advice. Uh, Brian Grissy, their local government coordinator, met with us several times and uh, gave us information that was very helpful. 
He also put us in contact with the APA mapping unit. Uh, that unit had a, a computer program that would uh, take a spot on the mountain and uh, find out where it was visible from anywhere on the lake or the road surrounding the lake. They used that information to uh, draw up a map of, uh, of what could be seen from the lake, uh, which is what we wanted to protect. Brian also put us in touch with uh, Aaron Zeman because uh, logging was an important issue uh, for our mountain sites. We wanted to uh, restrict clear cutting as best we could. Uh, we were uh, using uh, the APA standard of uh, 25 acres uh, of clear cut maximum in our town and uh, we thought that would look um, terribly obvious uh, if it was clear cut on one of our uh, mountains that was visible from the lake. So we used the uh, information from, from APA and from all these other sources and uh, we put together a, uh, a draft few shed law. Um, when we had our public hearing, our biggest uh, concern from uh, citizens at the hearing was on the logging issue. After the hearing, we met with uh, several logging companies from the local area, and uh, we were able to find out what their concerns were and to deal with those concerns. And uh, we mutually agreed on, uh, on a five-acre maximum clear cut within the uh, view shed area. The 25 acres would still be applicable uh, outside the view shed area within the town. <coughs> we, uh, we also restricted in order to uh, uh, control the clear cut and the clearing of individual lots by individual property owners, which was on the first slide uh, that I showed you by restricting uh, non-commercial clear-cutting, clear-cutting, which would be clear-cutting by individual property owners, to half an acre. That uh, would provide enough area for uh, uh, drain fields and, and the footprint of, of the piles. So, given that, we came up with this map that APA provided to us. The darker shade is uh, the forest state forest preserve land. The lighter green shade is the mountainside area that is now within our, our view shed protection uh, zone. You can see that it, it covers quite a bit of ground here. After the view shed law was passed, uh, Murphy's law says nothing's perfect and anything can happen. Uh, the winter after the law was passed within the town, we discovered this on top of one of our mountains, and it would be, uh, it is within the view shed area. We talked with our CEO to see how this happened, and uh, he said that uh, this property owner had a valid building permit before our uh, view shed act was passed, and even before the moratorium, which we had in effect while we were uh, uh, designing our view shed act. So uh, he just took his time building, and uh, it wasn't uh, obvious that uh, it was up there until the winter after our uh, view shed law was passed. Fortunately, it's only visible in the winter, uh, which this picture was taken the deciduous trees that uh, are in front of it make it visible in the winter, but it's completely covered uh, and hidden in the uh, summertime. Some other uh, concerns uh, after our law was passed, we had a uh, property owner come in uh, who owned property within a view shed area, and he wanted to develop it into a, uh, his home. We met with him. Uh, he flew a balloon at the height of, uh, of his house, and uh, we looked uh, from lakeside, and we could see the balloon 
So it was obvious that uh, what he was going to build would be would be visible, and uh, we discussed with them the requirements of the, that the view shed regulation staff, which include uh, the color of the building, the uh, uh, reflectivity of, uh, of the roof or the siding, uh, the reflectivity of, uh, of the window glass, uh, extensive uh, landscaping to, uh, to try to uh, uh, obscure the development as much as possible, uh, and other things. The, uh, the law itself is on the table outside, uh, uh, available for anyone interested. Uh, this particular homeowner went, uh, went back and studied uh, what was in front of him, and uh, he hasn't come back in two years. Uh, we hear that uh, he is going to build, but it will be in an area that uh, is outside our viewshed protection area. After our law was passed, we had uh, a committee. Our law was passed in 2005. After we Past that, we had a committee form to uh, revise our comprehensive plan within the town. Part of that uh, process involved uh, a survey of all of our homeowners, uh, both seasonal and, uh, and, and year-round. Uh, we got a response from 50% uh, of all the uh, mailings that we sent, which, which was amazing. Uh, it's usually much less than that. The overwhelming response was to keep the town just as it is now, no new major development. So that reinforced uh, the wisdom of our, our viewshed plan. We also uh, heard that and found that uh, ABA was considering uh, revising their clean uh, regulations. Uh, in some instances, the 25-acre uh, the maximum limit would, uh, would be revised upwards. Uh, this isn't as bad as it seems because the, uh, the, the uh, water that did that would have to belong to uh, uh, an organization that uh, had good woodland practices and uh, uh, used sustainable forestry. But uh, we think that uh, APA ought to exempt uh, areas that uh, uh, are special and, and have uh, existing protection for them uh, and make uh, any laws uh, within the park that uh, regarding logging uh, uh, not be applicable in these areas. But we, uh, we thank the park tremendously for all the support that they gave us throughout the development. Oh, well, we couldn't have done it without them. Thank you all. Our next, oh, yeah, I should mention that out on the table, uh, there are uh, this information about uh, this. Uh, the, the copy of this law that uh, Dave was just talking about, this uh, viewshed protection law, is available to anyone who's interested. Also, uh, Carmen Montgomery is, uh, has, has a, uh, a very interesting excerpt from the Pineland uh, Comprehensive Plan on uh, clustering. Uh, clustering is spelled out in considerable detail. Uh, in that part of New Jersey, and uh, it, uh, it leaves very little up to the discretion of the administering agency compared to what we have in the APA law, which I think there are two lines that refer vaguely to clustering and leave things wide open. Uh, so anyway, uh, our next speaker is Carlton Montgomery, and uh, he's going to talk about some interesting models from the Pinelands that, oh, I'm sorry, I got it mixed up. It's Dave, Dave Gibson. Uh, I've been getting Dave an awful tough time. I, I gave him the wrong title and everything, press release he sent out. But I, at least I got his name right, I think. It, it's Jim, is it? Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. It's Dave. Um, Dave has been uh, involved in Adirondack conservation work for a long time. He was uh, executive director of the Association for the Protection of the Adirondacks 
He's now a partner in a, a new organization, and uh, few people are more knowledgeable than he. And he's going to talk now about some good examples of things uh, that the APA has done over the years. And the APA will be glad to hear this because it gets an awful lot of criticism for things that it does. And, and here, here we're going to do some pra praising, I think. Uh, I think. You're on, David. <laughs>
we looked at these prior permits, all of them, in our estimation, adhere to the basic purposes and policies in resource management, rural use, and the land use classifications. Most were informed by some kind of natural resource inventory and assessment. Whether or not adequate, that's an ongoing debate. has been a debate at the agency for years. But the, um, had, all these permits were informed by some manner of assessment on the site. All concentrated development in, some, in a relatively small area of the project site, relatively near existing infrastructure. During the hearing, if there was a hearing, many of these permits had a hearing, use the hearing process to eliminate lots, to choose alternative locations based on decisions to sustain ecosystems, avoid fragmentation of large forest habitats, and all maintain the vast majority of the acreages on developed forest. So when Patton came to town in 1988, it had been to Vermont, it had uh, exploited parts of Vermont, uh, Patton came over to New York State and sought to develop raw lot acreages uh, all over the park. This was one example in the town of Gregg with a nearly 3,000 acre rolled out subdivision. They wanted to back it up. They could mathematically be eligible under the overall intensity guidelines of the APA for 225, 200, over 200 principal buildings. The agency held a hearing. How many of those are held? Very rarely. Agency held a hearing. They denied the project. It was inconsistent with the purposes of the act and the definition of rural use. The houses weren't clustered. This is all in the permit. Cumulative impacts of this and other projects could be significant and precedential. So they downsized the applicant, got the message, they downsized the project. A second hearing was held. The final permit reflected a lot of site analysis. There were trout streams, wetlands, gear wintering areas, forests throughout the site. The final appro permit approved 11 cabins, 800 feet or less, prohibited new roads, utilities, and you can read the rest. A forest management plan was required. Here's an example of the agency using a hearing and working with the developer to get to a solution. A couple years later in Butler Lake. Many of the advocates in this room who are my age, Dan's age, remember Butler Lake. Many of the agency staff who are retired or are active here uh, remember Butler Lake. This was a gridded out project on Butler Lake which was in uh, low intensity use in Herkimer County, town of Ohio. The APA looked at this and they found the impacts would be severe, undue. And they convinced the applicant to abandon the proposal. Well, there was a setup. Next owner proposed so many lots, same impacts. Staff urged abandonment, he did abandon it. After the adjudicatory hearing, they rejected it. The APA board rejected another proposal, which was 23 lots, seems sounds great but they were all gridded out around the lake, like on the left. That's the original proposal. Uh, they were all gridded out around the lake. So, APA said no, uh, and eventually permitted 23 lots clustered off the lake to preserve, as you can see, a large amount of the land, most of the lake shore, what a quality open space. And there were three open space lots. Again, the basic elements and principles of conservation design. We're at work here about the lake. Um, and notice that the, the final bullet, they did a, quite a bit of ecological site analysis to reach their determination. This was single ownership lake, it had minimal development, it had a high quality cold water fishery, it had spectacular features, natural features, bogs, canes, eskers, creeks, gorges, diverse wetlands, a deer wintering area, fabulous habitats for wildlife, and the opportunity to manage this forest 500 acres in perpetuity, if you wanted to do that. Given all that, the agency um, went to a kind of conservation design. As you can see, before, they, the deer went this is courtesy of the Iron Council, by the way, 1991, a little sketch they did. The deer went in the areas are shown in the right side, around Butler Lake, that's West Canada Creek, above, and then below is what the agency permitted, clustered subdivision, one side of the lake with the rest open space. So that was a good result from our point of view and the advocates uh, working with the agency felt the same. 
a few years later, up in the Mountain States. This was a very controversial subdivision in Johnsburg. A number of people here went to hearing with the agency on this project. And uh, originally 80 lots, um, they were ordered to hearing. The agency uh, permit reduced the number of lots by 25%, reconfigured the lots, used the hearing process to reconfigure the lots, and clustered all but two of them outside of the watershed. Design changes. Uh, the permit then also goes on, is, is at pains to point out the amount of the importance of this land ecologically and its significance within the region, this part of Warren County, this part of the Adirondack Park. What's the context of this project? That's what the, the staff is trying, really trying to point out. And they say it is, it is quite an important context. It's a magnet for wildlife, it's a unique resource within Warren County. It's one of the few projects or parcels of private ownership larger than 500 acres. It's significant, and we ought to pay attention. Um, Oven Mountain Pond was identified as a highly biodiverse area of the park. An unusually large number of small ecosystems creating an abundance of ecotones or edges between these ecosystems. This is language from the Act. The agency tried to be faithful to the Act's language and the regulations. And the next slide is a terrible slide. But you see on the upper right side and the top of the slide, that's lot 63A. That was the open space lot comprising the majority of acreage on the lot on the on this parcel that was set aside under this permit. So there was a relatively um, a relative degree of clustering here. The permit is very interesting in the sense that the agency within the permit questions whether this was the kind of clustering that the Act really requires. In, in this rural use environment classification. Um, there's a, not a lot of guidance given to the staff over the course of time about what constitutes clustering, substantial acreages, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But a pretty good result. Whitney was one of the big projects that we all feared was coming. Um, Mary Lou Whitney was getting on, Sonny Whitney had died. With this entire area, in the central Adirondack, surrounded by green, meaning resource management, all of it in resource. But what happened to it as, as the, uh, the owners aged and died? And uh, what we, you know, our worst fears were about to be realized. Um, Little Tupper Lake in the center of the slide, which is now part of our wilderness, uh, was going to be whacked up into all sorts of lots. But initially, uh, they came to the agency with applications for four lots, making plain that a lot more was coming. Uh, Bob Lennon at the agency at the time and other staff realized this is unlawful segmentation under the State Environmental Quality Review Act. They wanted to get a full sense of what was coming. What is the comprehensive plan for, for Whitney Lake, for, for Whitney uh, Park? They required a master plan in the permit for the four lots. They said, any future application will have a comprehensive plan with all surveys, biological and otherwise, completed and in place. So that permit left 45,000 acres in open space with recreational leases and forestry being the uses, 99% of the project area. Uh, they did a lot of, they, they used the Nature Conservancy, which had been working with the Whitney family to gain information about what was significant ecologically on the site. And they made note of those findings in the permit. Uh, the subdivision is clustered in that the lots to be conveyed are located on the northern end of the project site, the rest dedicated to open space values. And then finally, this statement by the staff. A traditional grid subdivision would reduce its future timber potential because segmented ownership would inhibit, inhibit integrated timber management for the entire site. The best way to utilize the resource and at the same time protect wildlife and open space values is to maintain it in a relatively unsegmented ownership. And we still have 30,000 acres of Whitney Park, and we're all wondering what will happen. What? Thank God, 15,000 acres is in the Whitney, William C. Whitney Wilderness today. But all that grain around it is um, up in the air. Diamond Sportsman, 2002, uh, in Colton. Uh, there's over 3,000 acres, and the agency permit uh, basically said there'll be some core open space lots here. The development 
such as it is, will be clustered around roadways and your infrastructure. And in any future permit, you're going to have to do some biological uh, surveys here and recreational management plans. We want to know what's, what your plans are in the future. Um, put, uh, so you can read that permit. But anyway, it's, it's a pretty good uh, example of an agency consciously aware of the law and its responsibilities. And there is, uh, the, in the center, the resource management portions of this project um, are continuous to Cary Falls Re Reservoir and Stark Falls Reservoir. There's a large swath of green heading up into the right-hand corner of that map. And all of that is an open space area in this permit. And the uh, development is along the roads. Archon has been mentioned today, a model for conservation design and development. This was noted by the agency staff in the decision to go to hearing on the ACR in Tupper Lake. They said to the commissioners at that time, this is the kind of project you should be aware of in your prior permitting that we should be modeling for the coming project. And uh, this is the nature of that project here in Horicon. This is near the northern, the upper part of the slide is right up against the Barrow Lake Wilderness area. And the project is concentrated along roads with one very large open space lot uh, for forestry and open space recreation. Brandwood Park, I won't go into it, it's very similar but it was permitted in 2007 with a large amount of open space uh, left over. The Club of Resort, of course, is the... never followed these principles. Um, from one end to the other, it was um, permitted out and, and parcelized out into various size lots. So it's an, it did not follow the prior precedent, as you can see from this inadequate slide. But. And Highland Farmers in 2012, Right after the ACR was permitted, this project came before the agency. And it was a 13-lot subdivision on 1,300 acres in resource. And um, six lots were developed, uh, were, were permitted for new buildings. Interestingly, the staff there presented a zone of ecological analysis uh, and uh, said there was sufficient overlap. Um, and that was not something quite new for it in, in the recent years. And, um, However, there was no requirement for ecological uh, for cumulative impact assessment prior to future applications, and it put off comprehensive planning to a future date. And that's the, uh, that, that was one of the negative points about that permit. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> now we'll get to the the introduction, I won't repeat that for Carlton Montgomery's talking about clustering, but they've uh, hit on some of that uh, and and just a fleeting reference in the APA Act to um, what what clustering is about. It doesn't say anything at all in fact. And so um, Carlton's from the Pinelands area of New Jersey, as I mentioned, he's executive director of the New Jersey Pinelands Preservation Alliance and um, he has some very interesting things to say about what goes on down there. Hello, thank you very much for having me here, especially bringing me on some of the finest days of creation. It's really extraordinary. Let me also ask, how many of you have been to the New Jersey Pine Barrens? Oh, good, that's about as many as Lake Tahoe. <laughs> For, for those who haven't, please come and visit. It's just as interesting as the Adirondacks, only a little bit smaller and a lot flatter. <laughs> In fact, all these mountains make me a little nervous. <laughs> but um, I'm going to talk uh, about clustering. Much of what I have said, or, or I plan to say, has been anticipated by Randall Arendt and by the other speakers. Um, I'm going to try to bring it to a little level of specificity from the Pinelands example, because it is one that arises out of a regional planning context that is in many ways analogous to what uh, you have in the Adirondacks and um, you know, has been adopted by regulation and therefore may be an interesting wall. 
Uh, we don't really have to talk about what cluster development is because we've already seen it. Here's one of Randall's illustrations. Um, you've already seen a lot of examples, so I'm not going to dwell tremendously on them. But I had a couple from my neighborhood. Um, this is one where all the houses are up here by Medford Village. I live right over here. All of this is protected, and you can see from photographs uh, how lovely it is. Uh, it's a mature development, so the trees have really done a great job. In fact, it's impossible to get a good picture of this cluster development because of the way it is designed. The most important thing here, though, is as a parent living nearby, the concentration of units on these uh, basically uh, uh, one fifth of an acre lot makes it fantastic for trick or treating. <laughs> in contrast to most subdivisions, where children have to walk an awfully long way to get a decent day. <laughs> but this is a, it's a beautiful spot. Um, so this is a moderately sized subdivision with uh, something like 70 units um, and uh, protection of uh, a large area near it. This is a much larger case. Uh, this is one called the Heritage Mineral Site. The original development was going to be 17,000 units, two huge shopping centers, and a heliport spread out over all of this area at the edge of the growth zones in the Pinelands. Because of threatened and endangered species issues, not because of a cluster requirement, the final resolution of this, which has not yet been built, is they get to build on 1,000 acres here, a couple hundred of which are actually old, uh, they're lakes from mining operation. But in exchange, um, almost 6,000, 5,500 acres will be permanently restricted for conservation. And the Highlands Commission has already rezoned, you know, redesignated this land consistent with this resolution. But one of the nice things that it shows is with clustering, the bigger, the better. Because you can get bigger natural resource benefits by connecting large lots with existing nearby large areas and get, you, know, you, you further that, that um, habitat protection, reduction of fragmentation with a really big parcel, and we'll return to that in a moment. Uh, so the benefits of clustering, we've been talking about these. You know, just very quickly, preserving natural habitats and or farmland, reducing forest fragmentation, Reducing water quality impacts, um, you tend to have smaller lots. Usually, for most people, only need less lawn, which is, in places like ours is a huge uh, water quality uh, problem. Um, and it also makes it easier to have community septic systems and innovative septic systems because people are closer together. They can share those costs, or the, the lots can share the costs, and you can get a better uh, septic outcome, scenic values, and of course, the ability. To achieve these goals while providing reasonable, often, as, as uh, Randall and Rand pointed out, often superior economic return for developers and landowners. So the Pylons cluster rule. I don't know how many of you picked this up, but uh, if you haven't got it already, when you leave, please take it. It's, a, it's the excerpts from the Pylons regulation, <clears throat> which was adopted in 2009. I have to say, no cluster development has been built pursuant to these regulations. A couple have been designed. None of them built because of the recession. But I'm sure that over the next couple of years, we'll start to see them happen. <clears throat> There's a regional planning context here. The rule is, uh, the Pilots Comprehensive Management Plan, which I'll show you in just a moment, visually is a mandatory regional program. Like the Adirondack Plan, it uh, overrides local zoning, or really local zoning has to conform with the regional plan. Uh, huge deal in home rule states like ours. The cluster regulation applies throughout the timelines, as you'll see, but the mandatory requirement that all developments must be clustered applies only in the forest and rural development zones. These are low density and very low density zones where sewers are not permitted. Um, <clears throat> they're the areas where um, advocates like us felt that clustering would have the greatest impact. And in the regional growth areas of the Pinelands, which are comparable to your Hamlet jurisdiction, but much larger as a percentage of the Pinelands uh, than you have for Hamlets, um, the, the main objective there is to try to use the land intensively and efficiently, because the quicker it gets used up, uh, the, the quicker there's going to be 
pressure to break down the barriers of conservation zones. So the focus for clustering had been on the lower density areas. Uh, so just to give you guys an idea, the plan was planted, you don't know it already. It's uh, almost a quarter of the state of New Jersey, 1.1 million acres, so decently sized. Um, about half of it is in private ownership at the moment, half of it in some form of public or conservation ownership. Two thirds um, of it is zoned for conservation, that is little permitted development, or in some cases essentially no permitted development, and about one third for various forms of growth. So this is, like um, you said before, a kind of a zoning map writ large. Um, like, like the Adirondacks, it respected existing settlements. It is not a national park model, it's a uh, regional uh, land use plan and growth management model. Uh, the greener bits are conservation zones, the brighter bits are uh, growth zones. So most of the growth zones you see tend to be around the edges. These orange parts are uh, the regional growth areas, the yellow is uh, rural development, and the darker green is forest area. This central area of the Pinelands is the preservation area. You really can't do anything there except grow cranberries and blueberries because they are native fruits. Uh, do forestry under strict regulations in theory. Um, and build yourself a home, but only if your family has a direct connection to that piece of land predating the Pinelands. So very heavily restricted in the center. Here are the forest area and rural development areas, about 40% of the Pinelands, where plus tree is now mandatory. You need to come set it up. Philadelphia is over here, and when city's down here. So, um, I think the Pinelands regulation helps to highlight some of the technical issues or policy issues that come up in trying to design a specific clustering uh, rule. And I want to go through some of those. They're actually, if you have this uh, excerpt, um, the points I'm making are highlighted in this uh, document. So, first, mandatory versus voluntary. Uh, a theme that has come up repeatedly. I have to say, in my personal experience, um, landowners, builders, and developers do not do creative things like better stormwater management, low impact development, or clustering unless they are required to, not because they are foolish or ill intentioned, but because it is always economically safer for them to do what they have always done and what the government has always approved in the past. So, my sense is that if you want to see clustering development, it's got to become mandatory in some fashion. Um, the the <coughs> Highlands regulation um, requires clustering in this, these forest and rural development areas um, with, unless you can show that the environment would be better off without it. I don't really know how that would happen, except in a very small, very oddly shaped parcel, but I guess it's possible. So, it is a presumption that is very, very strong. Um, that that's the only way you're going to get it to build. Municipalities have the authority to make it mandatory anywhere in the town. In the Pinelands, no town has done that. New Jersey just passed a statute that gives municipalities that authority throughout the state. We'll see if any of them take advantage of it. <clears throat> Second issue, contiguous and non-contiguous. So, um, in the Pinelands, Clustering only applies to contiguous parcels. If you think about two parameters, contiguity, are parcels connected, and common ownership, are they owned by one person? You have contiguous common own one owner, that would be a classic clustering situation. If you go to a non-contiguous parcel, where you can do it on non-connected parcels and not have the same owner, then you're really at a, what you would normally call a transfer of development rights situation. And every permutation between the two can be seen as a gradation between clustering and TDR. But in, in principle, they can have uh, similar outcomes. Uh, it's just that the transfer of development rights program allows you to operate on a much larger geographic scale and across um, ownership boundaries. In the case of the Pinelands, they've chosen to make it only common ownership and contiguous. 
but um, one could make it non-contiguous. One could allow clustering uh, where parcels are owned by the same landowner uh, or developed by the same builder, but are not connected to one another. And how to determine the number of units that are allowed? This is a very, can be a very naughty question. Um, one of the approaches that cluster ordinances sometimes take is um, that the developer is required to submit a yield plan. That is, what could you realistically get with a traditional development? And then you get the same number of units, at least as your baseline for the cluster development. And I think that has been the case with most of the examples that we've seen. The Pinelands Commission chose to take a different route, um, which we did not entirely agree with, but they found it to be simpler. And that is simply the number of acres under existing zoning gets you your base yield, depending on what the zoning density is. So for example, you don't remove wetlands before you calculate the number of units. Now that, we think, can lead to some really peculiar results, especially in an area like the Pinelands, where you have extensive wetlands. Uh, here you'd have steep slope issues. We don't have that much. Here you'd have that also. You know, do you remove those before you say how many units you could get? My own view would be that it's better to do a yield plan approach, only allow the number of units in the cluster development as you could get in a non-cluster development. Uh, but that is something that can certainly be argued one way or another. Um, and then do you consider a bonus density? Now, <clears throat> the Pinelands plan uh, regulation, which you'll see here, has a complex bonus density system. The original rationale, which I think does make sense, was this. Bigger clusters are better than smaller clusters, because you get bigger protected open space areas. So we want to give developers an incentive to aggregate lots. We want to give a developer an incentive to buy the neighbor's parcels and include them into a single cluster. So the way we're going to do that is that we're going to give bonuses for, for aggregating parcels. Our view was that that's a great idea, but it should only apply where the developer actually aggregates parcels that were not previously in common ownership. The Pines Commission decided they didn't want to deal with figuring out who or what when. And so they just said, you get the bonus whether you aggregate or not. And, and if you look at the chart in the regulation, you'll see that bonus can be as much as 40% above what the zoning would permit. And in many realistic cases, it's going to be 30%. Um, that was something that we as advocates uh, fought very hard against. We persuaded some municipalities to adopt ordinances that did not include the bonus or only gave the bonus on not non-wetland acres. Um, and the Pinelands Commission, because of its so-called municipal flexibility standards, uh, has approved those ordinances. But for the most part, in the Pinelands, um, you're going to see these bonus densities, and it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. You know, are you undercutting your environmental benefit by providing such a big bonus that you're adding that much more lawn, that much more septic effluent, uh, that much more impervious cover to the total development that you've undermined many of the purposes of doing this in the first place. Uh, so if one is considering bonus densities, I'd be very cautious about how they are designed. Um, and if they are going to be included, only include them in cases where you're achieving some real policy benefit, like bringing about the aggregation of, of lots so you can get a single big coherent development. Site design, um, location of units, that's something that's been talked about in a lot of these examples. Uh, it's very important, and as has been pointed out by fellow speakers, uh, if you're going to do it, you want to do it with some real data. And that's going to be especially important when you're talking about larger parcels that have a diversity of habitats and a diversity of resources. In the case of the Pinelands, the resources that tend to be the most uh, controversial are threatened and endangered plants and wildlife. And um, the only way you find out where those, what, whether those things are present is through doing rigorous surveys. So the topic of surveys has come up. It's a um, big problem in many cases. Uh, it, in the Pinelands, 
Developers, if they're going to have to do a survey, they want to pay for it. Why? <laughs> so, over 15 years of working in the pylons, I have seen everything from the most, okay, the most um, rigorous, accurate survey you could imagine, to a survey which is either utterly incompetent or wholly corrupt. <laughs> and without being in the minds of the people who did it, I can't say which. <laughs> The Pilots Commission has declined to adopt a funding mechanism like an escrow system or some other system to have the agency be the payor. As a result, surveys are not reliable unless you know the people involved. Um, and that's a critical issue, I think, in thinking about how surveys are done. Um, unless people in the environment are very different than people in New Jersey. <laughs> uh, protected lands. Um, what do you do with the protected lands? Easy to say, well, protect them. Right? We put a deed restriction on them, we put an easement on them, um, but a lot of complexities arise when you think about the future. Uh, under the Pineland system, they can go to a homeowners association, to a municipality, or to a nonprofit uh, conservation group. In my view, it should always be the first option, right of first refusal to a nonprofit conservation group. <laughs> Because that's the only way you get an independent right of enforcement of those, of those restrictions. As time goes on, as the builder is long gone, the first and second generation of homeowners are long gone, if it was farmland, that farmer may be long gone because perhaps their kids aren't interested in farming. Um, can be very, very difficult, like with any conservation easement, to track and enforce its protection and you could quickly start to see that protected land uh, become abused in any variety of ways. It can become an ORV park, it can become a dump, it can become a playground when it wasn't supposed to be. Um, it could even you know, start to have uh, structures built on it. So a critical issue is you've got to address a mechanism for tracking and enforcing those protected areas. And finally, I just want to mention farmland. Um, where you are, where you're protected, land is going to be a farm as opposed to a, a, a nature preserve, it raises different issues because that is an ongoing business. And it's a business that is driven by technology. So the farming that you see today may not be what the farmer wants to do five or ten or twenty years from now. In our area, a key issue are greenhouses. Greenhouses don't look a lot like farmland and they have very different ecological impacts. A nursery has a very different ecological impact than does um, a cornfield because of the way they use fertilizers. Um, farmers may want to expand their farmland. So uh, in the Pylons rules, they permitted, after much debate and a very elaborate rule, um, some expansion of farmland on the conserved land uh, for a certain period of time. We'll see how that comes out. But again, with farming, you've got to think about what are the economic drivers that may lead to change in the land use from what you anticipated when you designed that development. And I, that's really all I've got. I, I just want to reiterate the risks. You've got uh, voluntary standards may not yield a change of behavior. Poor site design, and I just give this as an example. To me, this is, this is one of the two clustered developments that has been designed but not built. It doesn't look a lot like clustering to me, because we've got two pieces of it that are uh, separated by a big piece of land in private ownership that isn't part of the deal. Um, you can easily see this turning into something that doesn't look at all clustered. Uh, you have issues of land use. This is a preserved piece of land um, where ORVs are just the uh, carrying it up and creating a lot of erosion, uh, an endemic problem in our area. Um, and then uh, what, what do you do with the bonus density? Uh, do you want to have it or not? And if so, how do you structure it to ensure you're achieving your goals? Well, it's a quarter after three. Let's take a 15-minute break and then uh, come back for a half an hour of Q&A. Um, uh